very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Kanan Kanaya, and I'm the Associate Director of Partnerships, uh, or we call it TNE programs, uh, with the uh, IEG Campus Malaysia. Prior to this, I was working with Middlesex University for 15 years, but now I am here in charge of uh, the training programs and uh, uh, running the programs locally here, two years, three years, over, and then part of it can be done in UNE, Australia, or any part of the world. Right, now thank you for taking your uh, time to come here for, uh, on this, uh, this beautiful occasion, Saturday, uh, to listen to uh, Professor Simon Adams. It is a bit cold here. It just reminds me of those days in UK. Uh, but, but I'm pretty sure that uh, Professor Simon will make it interesting and warmer. Uh, uh, Michael Adam. <laughs> okay, well, I, he is my colleague, but I just saw him today. So it will take some time for me to uh, recollect all these names. Anyway, without much ado, uh, I would introduce uh, to all of you uh, the Associate um, Professor and the Associate Dean of the Business School from uh, UNE, uh, Professor um, Caroline uh, Gross. Come on, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Conan. Well, good afternoon. Um, my name is uh, Professor Caroline Gross. I'm the Deputy Dean uh, of the Faculty of Science, Agriculture, Business and Law. I'd like to say a hearty welcome to all of our guests tonight, to our distinguished guest, Professor Faruqi. Thank you for coming. Uh, to my colleagues from the faculty uh, in, at UNE, Dr. Ying Shen and Dr. Shao Maramuthi. And in particular, uh, a special thank to, thanks to our colleagues from IEG, Mr. Khan Kanaya, thank you, and Mr. Tamil Shelvin, Thank you. And also a big welcome to Professors Todd Walker, Mingan Chok and Aaron Murphy, who I know would have liked to have been here today, but I gather they're on our live feed. So, hi guys. IEG graciously invited UNE to become part of the IEG family. And this is recognised by UNE having a support centre based here at the IEG campus. We've only been operational for, I think, about eight months, and we have some 300 students studying with UNE through our IUG support campus here, and they're studying uh, business. Malaysia feels like a second home to many of us. Uh, we have several staff uh, in the faculty that grew up in Malaysia, and so it's to this end that we wish to share our community with our community in Malaysia our opportunities in law and other areas at, uh, that can be studied from UNE. But I can't think of anyone better to inform us uh, than our speaker tonight, Professor Michael Adams. Michael joined UNE as the head of school in law in January this year. He brings significant leadership experience to UNE and to our community. Most recently, he was the Dean of Law at Western Sydney University from 2007 to 2017. Prior to his time at Western um, Sydney University, he was Professor of Corporate Law. He's been involved with, or still involved with Perpetual Trustees Australia, Chair of Financial Services and Law. And he's been an Assistant Director at the UTS Centre for Corporate Governance. So as these titles allude to, Professor Adams is a specialist in Australian corporate law and international corporate governance and has expertise in financial services regulation, information governance, consumer protection and the broader area of legal technology and education. He's published 12 books, 35 plus book chapters. He's probably done a few of these in the last 12 days. He's so prolific. A hundred, or more than a hundred articles and has present, presented in over 250 conferences, uh, seminars in the last 30 years and I think this is his 12th presentation in the last week. <laughs> it's my great pleasure to introduce to you my colleague, uh, Professor Michael Adams. Thank you, Michael. We're looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Caroline's suggestion. So if you don't know, my, my Chinese name is also Michael, or Michael, Adams. So, uh, 
So there you go. We, we won't forget, Michael. There we go. I can hear myself. That's good. Um, today, I'm going to take you on a journey, particularly focusing on Malaysia and Australia, in a global legal profession. Many years ago, around the world, law was very much a jurisdictional special area. So you became a lawyer in one place, and basically you worked in that one place. But in today's world of interconnectivity, it is now important that we all understand different jurisdictions. I've had the pleasure, and you may pick up from time to time my accent, though I've lived in Australia for 30 years, I was educated and grew up in England. And so my university was the University College London, UCL. And as such, I have a, obviously a, a deep knowledge of English law. I practiced in England before bumping, physically, not metaphorically, into a young lady in a pub in London. Now that lady has now been my wife for 30 years, but it did mean I had to move all the way to Australia. In Australia, we of course have different jurisdictions. So I'm sure you know there are a number of states. New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, and then there's a one on the other side of the country called Western Australia, which is so huge, so massive, it will blow your mind how far you can fly and you're just in one state. Each of those areas have their own laws with their own lawyers. And then of course we are a federated country, so there is a law that fits over the top. And later in my presentation, I will compare Malaysian Federation with Australia, and also with our history, of course, Britain. This is going to be more of a general talk, and that by that I mean my special area is corporate law and corporate governance, and I would love to talk to you about that. But for the time and the audience, we felt this was a more useful area. It also, as Caroline mentioned, fits into my own passion at the moment, which is about information technology. In the world of business, in the world of government, you need data. You need accurate, speedy information to make decisions. Lawyers are now at the cutting edge of having to use information technology in new and different ways. One simple example. If you are going to sue a company, you may want to know every email between a department for the last three years. You will go to court and ask a judge to give you an order to have every email. Now, in a company, let's say the size of Maybank, the Malaysian bank that I use, that probably would be a million emails. How do you then sort through to find the one where the person said, hey, we're going to rip you off? Well, the answer is artificial intelligence. You will program it to search for keywords and to delete other areas. You will take that million emails and bring it down to 20,000. And then you will run the program again and get it down to 10,000. And then you will fill your rooms with lawyers, usually young lawyers, junior lawyers, who you don't have to pay very much for. Just like my daughter. She's a third year lawyer. And she will sit there with a screen because a human can read much more instinctively than a machine. So a machine can take from a million and get it down to 10,000. But it still needs humans to go through and go, that one's relevant, that one's not. But with machine learning, we will be able to take it down to probably 10 or 20. I would like UNE future lawyers to have these skills. So I'm going to talk about information technology as part and parcel of what we're going to do. Now, if my, my, ah, oh, there we go, making sure my little clicker works so I can, there we go, very good, all right. So what I'm going to cover in about an hour, and by the way, if you have a burning question, you can wait to the end, or I'm pretty relaxed that I'm quite willing to take 
uh, <laughs> I'm looking at my colleague Ying, to take photos, no, 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 to take questions on the fly. So if, if I say something, when I get enthusiastic and excited and fast, I think, whoa, whoa, just pop up your hand, ask a question, even if it's just, would you repeat what you just said? But there will be time at the end where I'm very happy to answer as many questions. But remember, I charge for every six minutes. Think about the cost. So I'm going to deal at the beginning with the global legal profession, where things are happening, particularly in the common law English speaking world. Then I'm going to run through a little history of the British common law, compare it to Malaysia, compare it to Australia, then talk about legal technology, and then I guess I wish to have the pleasure of launching a new program called the, the Diploma of Paralegals. And I'll explain how that fits in and how UNE is working with our great partners here at IEG. By the way, I used to come to Malaysia many, many times, four times a year for a quality control at another institution. I love Sate, but sadly, because we only came in from Bangkok yesterday, and the day before that we were in Hong Kong, and the day before that we were in Beijing, and the day before that we were in Yantai, and the day before that we were in Shanghai, and the day before that we were, oh yeah, we were in Australia, which was nice. Uh, and tomorrow, we're in Tokyo, so it's a bit strange. But I haven't had any sate. How can I come to KL without having sate? This is a clear deficiency. I am sure I will have an opportunity to make up this deficiency. All right. When I do a presentation, I like to embarrass my two beautiful daughters. And the reason I do it, one is because they're my beautiful daughters and I'm allowed to, but more importantly, Lucy is a law graduate and a Bachelor of Communications, and as I said, she practices in a large law firm. Lucy was naturally good at English and history. The research shows us that students who are good at English and other humanities subjects, particularly history, tend to excel in law. They have the ability to read and analyze and write. But I have two daughters. By the way, one has green eyes, one has blue eyes. One has blonde hair, one has red hair. Where do these children come from? <laughs> I have brown eyes, if you didn't notice. Uh, Jessica, she did a Bachelor of uh, medical radiation science. So she specialises in, in radiation for cancer uh, patients. Jessica could not write a story in English if she tried. She does read stories, but writing a sentence, whoa, but give her her Sudoku. She looks at it and goes, Drrr. and I look at it and go, well, how do you do that? So mathematics was natural, physics was natural, chemistry was natural, and she excelled. So she now saves people's lives with radiation by using her skills. Obviously, I'm equally proud of both girls, but my point being, just because I'm passionate about law does not mean that other people would, and I certainly respect those differences. We need everyone, don't we, Caroline? Obviously, I'm a lawyer. Caroline's a scientist, and we respect both very much. Many people ask me, where is Armidale? I ask the same question, where is Armidale? Well, this is the, the city of Sydney. Now remember, our ca federal capital is Canberra, which is roughly halfway between Sydney and Melbourne. Armidale is halfway between Sydney and Brisbane, and it's about two hours in from the ocean. I miss the ocean. And as somebody said, it is quite cold in Armidale because we are a thousand meters above sea level. The, we are actually the highest city in Australia. When the university was created, the university actually comes from 1938. It's the oldest regional university. But when the university gained independence from Sydney University, at that time, Madrick said, the student, not the subject, must remain the central feature of the university. So even today, the reason we win so many awards for teaching and learning is because we try to be student-centered. That's our, our passion. We're a great research university, and we do all the other things you would expect, but our students 
are our passion. And that is incredibly important. By the way, that is graduation, which is very beautiful. And it's outdoors. We're one of the few universities that do outdoors. A mere one hour drive, we have all these national parks. Now, the moment we're having a drought, the, that waterfall would not look like that. Oh, I miss the ocean. Um, that's a couple of hours drive, but that's okay. That's okay. And this is our vice chancellor's house. So the president of the university and the senior staff. And uh, it actually has a very nice restaurant, which is good. We do a lot of functions there. But when you look to the future, in 2025, we hope to take our lifelong learners using cutting edge technologies, which I certainly love, to make us, as we already are, but even more world class. And relationships like this with IAG and using our technologies are perfect examples of that vision. That again reflects our graduation. This year in April, I had the honor of reading the names of the law students. We had five PhD students in law, uh, and our other parts of our faculty had many, many more. But it was a wonderful experience. We had about 120 LLB graduates in that. We do three graduations per year. All right, let's talk about, let's talk about lawyers. Now, I said scientists, and I'm looking at Carol, whenever I think of scientists. Scientists are wonderful people. And some scientists get to change the world. They, they have breakthroughs, which are amazing. But they're one-offs. In fact, one of the most interesting things, look at Nobel Peace Prizes. The Nobel Prize is a fantastic recognition. It usually takes 20 to 30 years to win a Nobel Peace Prize. Sorry, a Nobel Prize, period. Very rarely are they won by an individual. Most of the Nobel Prizes are won by teams of researchers. In some areas, there will be an individual. Last year, the individual was for literature, so the person wrote a book. Most work in teams. But when you come to lawyers, it's really interesting, because they are both individuals and they work in teams. So let's look at through some famous ones. So in Australia, 14 out of 30 of Australian Prime Ministers have all been lawyers. 12 out of our 44 Premiers. 24% of the Governor General. Now the Governor General is the Queen Elizabeth II's agent. So because Queenie lives in Buckingham Palace in England, she doesn't want to travel even first class to Australia. So she delegates. A bit like our Vice Chancellor has delegated, you heard, to Todd Walker, I hope he's watching, and Todd delegates to Aaron Murphy, and Aaron, because unfortunately, and he's, seriously, he would have loved to be here, I'm, he's not well, has delegated to Caroline, <laughs> and then they delegate to me. And I get to delegate to my colleagues here, Charles and Ying, which means we don't do anything really, we just stand around and talk, not true at all. We are a team, we work together to make the difference. Now, I don't like to talk politics. <laughs> That's not a serious statement. Of course I love to talk politics. <laughs> Lawyers and politics are great. And Malaysia's having some very interesting political times. I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> Unless you give me satay, then I'll talk about that. <laughs> Baroness Margaret Thatcher is a very significant woman because in the Western world, she was the first female prime minister. She has twins. For the slow learners here, that's two babies at the same time. Those twins were born when she was doing her bar examinations. So not only was she incredibly smart and hardworking, and her first degree, if I remember, was chemistry. She actually was a scientist before she became a lawyer. She actually took her final bar exams very close to having her twins, and went on to be a very strong change agent for the UK. Question, which university did she study at? I'll come to that in a moment. Nelson Mandela. If you have not read A Long Walk to Freedom, you have not read a book. Nelson, remember, was in jail for a long time. While he was in jail, he had spent time studying law. When he was offered the opportunity 
to wear long trousers rather than shorts. Remember, this is the period of apartheid, racial discrimination. The he in prison, as a man, had to wear short trousers, not long trousers. If you were white, African, you can wear long trousers in prison. But he had to wear shorts. And he complained under human rights. And the prison officers and the politicians said, Nelson Mandela, we will let you wear long trousers. But he was a matter of principle. He said, no, 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 not just me. Everyone on the island will wear trousers. They did not allow any of them to wear trousers. He studied law at oh, another university that um, happened to be the same university as Baroness Margaret Thatcher. Mm, I wonder which one. It wasn't UNE, by the way. Gandhi, India's most significant prime minister. He also studied law. He was a freedom fighter. No, you mean Nelson Mandela was? Okay, I get it. Okay. Do you know which law school he studied at? No, no, no. CC, yeah, CC. Yeah, yeah, no. University of London doesn't exist. There is no such thing as the University of London. He, no, no. Wrong again. This is gain show. Good. All right. So did he study at the London School of Economics? No. Did he study at Imperial College? No. Did he study at King's College? No. He studied at the original University of London, which had to be the same place I studied at. <laughs> University College London, UCL, one of the oldest universities after Oxford and Cambridge. Why did UCL come into existence? Because to go to Oxford or Cambridge at that time, you had to be a Christian. So if you had any other faith, you were not allowed to attend university. UCL was the first English university where a Jew or a Hindu or a Baha'i or any other faith, including Islam, was accepted. By the way, interesting enough that even in UCL's times, you weren't allowed to be agnostic or atheist. That was not acceptable. In that society of that time, nobody really was. Even if they didn't think it, they weren't. Does that make sense? but they were open to all, all, all faiths. Uh, for those of you who have a law background, and I know we have a few people in the audience, of course, Jeremy Bentham, one of the great legal philosophers. So when I was there, Jeremy Bentham's bust, his head was brought out at exam time to terrify all the students. I want to bring that back to UNE, but it'd be my head to scare the students. No, no, we won't do that. Um, Gillian Triggs. Gillian Triggs was the Dean of Sydney Law School, a good friend of mine. She was the Human Rights Commissioner for Australia, and amazing. Mary Cauldron was Australia's first female High Court judge. Now, I want to stress here, names are important. The High Court of Australia in the Constitution of 1901 is the highest court. It is the final court of appeal. In other jurisdictions, including the UK, the High Court is low court. It's an important court. Confusingly, our Supreme Court in Australia is our first court, and in the UK, the Supreme Court is now the highest court, as it is in the United States. So with terminology, be very, very careful. I don't usually talk a lot of Russian, but I do like vodka. Vladimir Lenin, the leader of the Soviet Union, was a lawyer, and he helped draft their constitution. Now this, on, who knows Rebel Wilson? Does anybody know that name? There's a movie called Pitch Perfect, which is about singing, and there's an Australian girl called, quote, Fat Amy. Now you're laughing, have you seen it? Yeah, yeah. I have, so I have two daughters, of course I've seen it. And Rebel Wilson studied law, even though she's now a famous actress for other reasons. And then Peter Garrett, Peter Garrett was in a very famous band called Midnight Oil, which who performed in London uh, last week. But he also was a lawyer who became Australia's environmental minister. Very interesting indeed. All right. I've already declared I am English, but I am very proud that Australia has the oldest living culture in the world. We know it is at least 
60,000 years. We have 700 different language groups. Now, we don't use the word tribes. We use the term peoples. But think of them like tribes. As such, if we were in Australia, and I was coming to this place, and I am obviously an Englishman from Hampshire, I would walk up, Charles, can you, you, for this demonstration, can you come and stand here? That way you're on the video and you'll learn. My colleague, Dr. Charles. Hello. Hello. <laughs> so, so, in Armadale, our land belongs to the Anawan people. Okay? That's the name of those people. So if you don't mind, you need to pretend to be an Anawan person. So you just stand there. Right, stand there looking beautiful. Okay. All right. So I'm coming from another region. Okay? I'm allowed to walk up. And imagine there will be a river here, or there will be a mountain. There will be a geographic barrier. And I would walk up, and I would have to sit down, because I know that that land does not belong to me. And I'd have to wait until... An Anawan. Now, it is a bit sexist, it probably would be a man, but for this role, we don't live in a sexist society. Mm -hmm. And I go, hello. Yeah. And you say hello. hello. And then you say, look, actually, I want to get to Coffs Harbour, which is another land. But for me to walk across that land, are you happy? And in fact, she would walk with me across the land. And we might stop and eat some food and hang out. And then when I get to the barrier, mm -hmm. then Ying might mm -hmm. meet me an escort. Thank you. That's why when we give a public lecture, we always acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. And the land is below the ground. It is the sky above the ground. And it is the land itself. Australia has not always had this love of the Aboriginal people. And the reason is the law. See, the law saw Australia as terra nullis, Latin for barren land. And it wasn't until 1992 that the High Court of Australia finally went, oh, Aboriginal people, they've been here a long time. They have rights. I'll explain some more later, but it's very, very significant. So I, for the sake of the video, we should acknowledge the, in Australia, the Anawan people that we now work on their land. This, by the way, is the courthouse in Armidale. It is now the old courthouse, and Caroline and I would love the law school to own it for the university because it's such a beautiful... I took that photo. Where's our IP lawyer? Yeah, my copyright, okay? Don't try, don't try and steal it. And look at the sky. Look at your sky. Mm, what do I see? Grey, blue. Grey, blue. We don't have any pollution. It's very beautiful. So, let me run through global lawyers. We use this term solicitor. Now, that doesn't mean to solicit, as in go out and do something bad. A solicitor is very analogous to a GP, a general practitioner for the medical profession. So if you have a legal problem, you will go and see a person who has some knowledge of the law. Now, if they're a good lawyer, they should say, I'm good at this, this, and this. But my colleague, now my colleague may be in the firm, the same law firm practice, or it may be another firm. A good lawyer should refer. When I met this wonderful gentleman in the back, he said, we are IP lawyers. I would not go to him for criminal law. His job might be to me to say, Michael, you have an interesting problem, but actually you really should see my friend who's a good criminal lawyer. Does that make sense? So our areas of practice will, will impact. A barrister is the term we use for an advocate, somebody who represents you, particularly in litigation. They tend to specialise it to, to quite a, a particular degree. And although their initial academic training is the same, they do then change the way they approach the particular work. The original term for both solicitor and barrister was actually the term attorney. So although we look at the Americans and often say, oh, why do they still call them attorneys? That's actually the word that we use. It's a bit like, uh, again, somebody can tell me, in Malaysia, do you talk about autumn or fall? Autumn. Autumn is the modern English word. The old English word is fall. 
the Americans actually use the correct word. We use the wrong word because language changes. I can see some nods. That means you're all learning something new. Nothing to do with law, but you're learning something, and that's always good. Most Australians tend to study a law degree with another degree over five years. The common model, so uh, you saw the example, my daughter studied a Bachelor of Communications. She could have done a Bachelor of Arts, a Bachelor of Business, a Bachelor of Science, a Bachelor of Computing and Law. And one of the real challenges for students is in their early studies is do I want to be a lawyer or do I want to be a business person, a banker, an accountant, a, a patent attorney or whatever? You don't actually have to make the decision to the end. But in fact, your grades, very interesting. If you're going for a law job, <laughs> we only look at the law degree, we don't care about the other degree. If you're going for that other degree, the law results don't really matter. But of course, what I want is people to get the best, the best results overall. That's important. Australia follows the UK and Malaysia in still having predominantly the Bachelor of Laws, the undergraduate LLB model. However, we are following America and moving to the JD programs for graduate entry. Thus, you've done a degree earlier in your life. You get to use your mid-30s and go, I know I want to be a lawyer. So the JD fits very much the American graduate school. The equivalent, by the way, is doctors. Medical doctors have always been a Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Surgery, or Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery. We call them doctor out of history. They're not real doctors. You have to have a PhD to be a real doctor. But you're a medical doctor. Now, every medical school in Australia uses the term MD, medical doctor, which is straight out of America. Two universities, Western Sydney and UNE, actually tried to stop and said, that's crazy. But when every other medical school changed, pretty well, market pressure forced. So in Australia, in that UNE, we actually have a graduate LLB, which is the same as the JD, but half the price. But market pressure may probably end up forcing us to adopt a JD model for our graduate students and we will have to charge them more money. Market forces, the world of nature. Are the students better as a JD or a combined LLB? Well, if I actually do work in a law firm, we always hire double degree students over a JD student. It will be another 10 years before JD students are treated actually anywhere close to a good LLB student. Once you finish university, you still have to do six months training, practical legal training, which enables you to understand some certain rules on ethics and trust accounts, and also get some real life experience. Usually as a paralegal, that's the term we give to those people who are still studying. At the moment, Australia does not have bar exams like the US. My prediction is in the next 10 years, Next 10 years, we will go to a bar exam type model. Lawyers are organized usually through partnerships. Some act as sole traders, usually barristers. In some jurisdictions, like New South Wales, we allow limited companies in a very narrow way. Small firms end up being boutique. They have a specialization like IP or corporate social responsibility or some other area. Medium-sized firms are the 10 to 20 partners, usually another 20 to 50 lawyers, and usually about 100 support staff. And they are thriving, but they will suffer the costs of technology. The large firms go from 50 to up to 500 partners. They have huge overheads. They usually have the fanciest premises, and they charge very, high fees, but they have the depth of work whereby it is a billion ringgit deal, they will handle the staff they need. Remember I gave you that example of a million documents down to 20,000? You need a big firm 
to read 20,000 documents overnight, or maybe in two days, to give an answer. We are beginning to see the growth in global firms. That is, law firms which operate in multiple countries. Legal profession is about 10 to 15 years behind the accounting and consulting professions in terms of that organisation. The big growth is in counsel, that is, in house lawyers. So you are a lawyer, but you only work for one employer, whether it be government or commercial. I'm going to skip over that because of time, and and because I want to talk a little bit about that comparison. The world is basically divided into three types of law. Now I'm going to start with the oldest, because obviously I probably am a bit biased that it's the most important. This funny little island here. I mean, when you look at the world, how can this little country have so much power? There is an answer, by the way. The weather, it rains a lot, so they're indoors and they read. It rains a lot, which gave some water, which meant their power and their ability to industrialize meant the Industrial Revolution followed the Agrarian Revolution. And they were quite smart sailors. They had a navy that actually wanted to trade, particularly Originally, by the way, right down here and around, but then they finally got through the Suez Canal to this country here. India was the perfect market. Lots of people, I know it didn't have a billion people there, but they would send a ship loaded with goods and sold it in India. And then they filled the ship up with spices and silk and things that have huge high value, but actually low weight. So you can fill the ship up. What a business model. You send something full and you sell it and you make a fortune. You fill it up, you bring it back, you sell it and make a fortune. Shipping provided the most valuable country on earth at that time. But this country was a bit of a control country. By the way, I'm talking about a thousand years ago. And a French guy, does anybody know what his name was in 1066? His name was William the Conqueror. He was a French dude. Now, France, don't forget, is just here. This funny little place here. He, the previous king, promised this king that when he died, he could have the country, just as you do. Have a country. And then when he died, the English people said, no, 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 no. No French person is going to have our country. So William, the conqueror, emphasis on the word the conqueror, sent his army over, killed the king. Does anyone know how he died? It's quite famous. An arrow in his eye. And he died. And so William, the conqueror, became the king of England. But there was a problem. Does anyone know what the problem was? He was French. The French don't speak English. And not many people knew Latin, which was the common language. So the king had this great idea. Wouldn't it be good, rather than having local laws, in Malay, by the way, adat, customary law, wouldn't it be great to have a common law? The whole country to have the same laws in the same language. What a great idea. And then they thought, this idea is so good. Why don't we share it with, uh, oh yeah, the whole of North America and Canada? And what about Africa? And what about Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Nepal? And what about Australia and New Zealand and part of Indonesia? That's why a third of the world, including Malaysia, follows the common law. All because one Frenchman went, I can't communicate with you. I want to have one language and one system. Isn't that pretty cool? And a thousand years later, We're still doing it. The other law, the blue, is called the Civil Code. And the Civil Code predominantly was a Roman law. It was a Roman principle, so out of Italy. But France really took the Civil Code under Napoleon and made it incredibly useful around the world. And between these European nations, they took over a lot of Africa, (laughs) a lot of... Russia, and uh, Ying, where would this be? 
I, that's China. Yeah, that's China. Actually, Russia's bigger, isn't it? China's shrinking. And a billion people. Yeah, see, this? Oh, <laughs> worth thinking about. Um, yeah, look at South America. Anybody know what country that is? Uh, Belize, which is British rule. Uh, so that's how we end up. Now you're looking and thinking, mm, this is interesting. How come there's a few different colors? They're the countries with a mixed system whereby often Islamic law for family law and personal matters, as well as the common laws of codes, go hand in hand. So what we refer to in Malaysia as the dual system fits in beautifully, as we see in Hong Kong, etc. Here, it is also a Dutch law because of their influence over Southern Africa. And also here, of course, the French influenced this part of Canada. And obviously, here we are in Malaysia, where that mixed system also plays a role. All right, I'm looking at the time. That's good. I've got plenty of time. Although that sate is ticking in my head. Isn't that good? I also believe there's afternoon tea. But there's more to be studied, more of interest. All right. I, I will go through this little bit. British law, United Kingdom, very interesting. It's made up of three separate systems, so England and Wales, and then Scotland has its own variation, and then Northern Ireland. I'm not going to talk about Brexit. I'm very sad that Brexit is happening. I'm, I'm a, truly a European. I have an Australian passport and I have a European passport, which happens to say British. I travel mostly on my Australian passport, but I, I am proud of that other passport. Northern Ireland is actually the reason why Brexit's in a big problem. Because Northern Ireland is part of Ireland. Ireland is part of Europe. And how do you have people going in and out of an area without border control. And that's really one of the biggest problems for the British politicians. How do you become a separate country out of Europe but actually have no borders? That, that really is num one of their major challenges. I'm glad I'm not a politician. Britain, for such a famous country, has an unwritten constitution. Most countries in the world have a written constitution telling you what you can do, what you can't do, how parliament works, how courts work. UK, make it up as you go along. But again, for over a thousand years it's been working, which is pretty special. What it means is most countries love rules. So you could have a rule that says, you may, me, person, human, walk up to that line. Ah, <laughs> oh, but I'm not allowed to go over the line. But what happens if I'm here and I put my foot here? Oh, well, am I over the line? Do I break the law? Well, if you have a rule like a constitution, you can define it. The UK has no rule, which means if there is a line, I might be able to do this, or this, or this, or this, Oh, i just taken my foot off. At this point, I break the law. But I won't know that until the court tells me. And the problem with that is uncertainty. You don't know what you don't know. The upside is lawyers can push the law and push the law and push the law and push the law to create whole new laws. Now, I'm dying to embarrass my wonderful colleague, Charlene Ying, to say, do you know a case in 1932 which actually changed the face of law because somebody pushed the boundaries? I'll give you a little bit of a clue so they're not embarrassed. Donahue and Stevenson. You know that case? Yeah, they do. It's the history of tort. The tort of negligence, one of the most significant legal actions, did not exist until 1932 when a Scottish lady had a knickerbocker glory, that's like a, a, a fruit salad with ice cream and something called ginger beer. No, it's not alcohol, it's a soft drink. And in that bottle was a snail. And poor Mrs. Donahue, she was very sick. So she sued. She sued the cafe. And the cafe went, hey, it's a brown bottle. I didn't know what was in it. So she then sued the manufacturer. Because when you sell food and drink, you expect it to be consumed. 
That case in 1932 changed the history of the tort of negligence and gave us the most significant civil right we've ever had. Why? Because there's no written constitution. Because the lawyers push and push and push. Isn't that cool? All right, some famous legislation, the Magna Carta, that's their basic rights bill, 1215. It says Bill All Rights, should be Bill of Rights. European Communities Act's been around since 1972. The Constitutional Reform Act, which changed the way Parliament and the courts operate. And thus, the House of Lords, the political arm, is actually known as the, now the Supreme Court. And we have layers down to the Magistrates' Court. The magistrates' Courts tend to handle about 98% of all the work. What about Australia? Well, we were invaded, ooh, that's a bit political. Captain Crook, Cook landed and went, there's nothing here, so let's have our country. And he said, all British laws should be just popped into our system. So Australia just had British laws, all just arranged. I mentioned Terra Nullis. It ignored Aboriginal Indigenous people until 1992 in this Marbo case. If I had longer, I'd give you a long lecture on the a power of Marbo. Just accept it as significant. In 1828, basically, we were told we had to have British laws. Then, in Federation on the 1st of January 1901, the Commonwealth of Australia Constitution Act was created, UK. One of the funniest things for Australians, and I love Australians, and I love Australia. And you go, where's your constitution? And they go, oh, it's in Canberra. You go, ah, no, it's not. It's in the Palace of Westminster in London. The Australian constitution is an English act of parliament. It's not Australian at all. Queen Victoria, it's her act. She's the one that signed it. Remember I mentioned Queen Elizabeth II? Well, she came to Australia in 1988 to celebrate 200 years, the bicentenary. And do you know what she gave as a present to the Australian people? The original Act of Parliament. She handed over her copy, which now sits in Parliament, signed by Queen Victoria, the original one. It's still a British Act of Parliament, by the way, but at least the physical document is now sitting in Canberra. In 1986, Australia finally went, whoa, let's, we're a long way from Britain. We have our own laws, our own courts, and this is where we cut the tie to Britain from a legal perspective. So after 1986, we never appealed to the UK. We have our own courts and our own system. But 1986, gosh, I've been a lawyer for two years. That's a bit scary, it's not that long ago. Um, we have a federal court system with the high court at the top, the federal court in the middle, and we have state courts which go down to the New South Wales Supreme Court, District Court. And in New South Wales, we call it the local courts, but in Victoria, they call it the magistrates' courts, just one of those, those, those beauties. What about Malaysia? Well, historically, you had customary law, which made perfect sense. And then before 1957, there were local laws, and then after colonisation, imported the UKs. But Australia has always had an influence on Malaysian laws. So has India, particularly the Malaysian criminal law is straight out of the Indian code with obviously local adaptation. So that connection, but of course that's all part of that Commonwealth, British Commonwealth history. Without doubt, the federal constitution is the supreme law within the legal system, but Malaysia operates a really good dual system where Islamic law plays obviously a critical role for all personal matters. Commercial matters, so contract and tort and corporates, etc., are dealt with under the legislation and common laws you would expect. You also, I'm sh very well, I'm sure, of the federal laws of Parliament in Malaysia, the state laws where relevant. Particularly refer to Australian law and Indian law and Singapore law because there is that similarity of history. So the case law in particular. As you all know, East and West play, play some significance. And I wanted to appreciate uh, Dr. Shah and her comments and from her book, which I'll mention a little bit later. The fact you have two high courts is amazing. We're going to talk about uh, that a little bit later. Last couple of general comments. Then I want to move into technology and a few other bits and bobs. Law is not that hard. It's not that difficult. 
It starts with basic building bricks, as every discipline does. That is, you need fundamental knowledge. So, in my area, you, to understand corporate law here, you understand contract law, you understand tort law, you understand criminal law, you understand trust law, and you build up the bricks. Nobody expects a student to jump in and know everything. You start. So, if you're a scientist, and I'm not going to look at Caroline because she might tell me off. You have to learn the periodic table. Is that right? Isn't that a good starting base? And it makes sense to know the periodic table? That's the end of my scientific knowledge, by the way. That's the end of it. In law, you learn those basic things. But a lawyer, the honourable part of our profession, is represented by Rodin's thinker. It's actually about thinking about the law, analysing the law, thinking of novel, new and fresh ways to solve problems. That's where lawyers earn their money. It's not from a machine X plus Y equals Z. It is much, much more complex. Does anybody know who this guy is? He is French. And he's one of the greatest theorists ever to live. His name is Montesquieu. Without Montesquieu... Now, there's an irony here, by the way. He's French. The French don't even do what I'm about to show you. Montesquieu gave us the separations of powers theory. That is, the government has to be split into three parts. Legislature, that makes laws. The government, the executive, who is required to administer those laws. And then the judiciary, to help interpret those laws. Montesquieu wrote that theory hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and it is still good today as it was when he first drafted it. So you have to understand some theory. You have to understand how it fits into the, the real world. If I had a lot longer, I would go through some case examples. But I'm just going to run down. This, by the way, I put this one in. Anybody who has ever met me, every student I've ever taught in 35 years, when they meet me, they go, Michael, Salomon! Because it's my favourite case. I love Mr. Salomon. But I'm not going to tell you about him. You have to come and do my class. I'm going to skip straight through to this case in 2018. HCA, High Court of Australia. Do we all know Google? What does Google do? A search engine. Okay. If you have this name, T-R-K-U-L-J-A, would you think that's a pretty unique name? Pretty special? Yeah? Wouldn't it be really bad if that name belonged to a gangster? A really bad dude who kills people and takes their money. And your name is the same. But it's not you. And wouldn't it be really, really unfair if a newspaper has your photograph but the gangster's name? So if people come along and want to go, Google, tell me about gangsters in Australia. And bing, this name comes up. This man sued Google to say, I want your search engine to stop connecting this criminal with me. And what's interesting is he won. Google had to go in and rewrite their algorithms for being able to search for that name. By the way, Google argued they could not do that. They could not change the search engine. And the court said, ha, find a way. And Google had to spend a small fortune finding a way to protect this man who was completely innocent and he just had the shame to have the same name as a, as a bad man. Isn't that interesting? Who thought law was going to be interesting? Some of you. Some of you. All right. Oh, I'm looking at my Charles. Charles and I both teach corporate law and this is the heart of corporate law. But guess what? I'm going to skip over it because I could be here for hours. And morning, morning tea, even afternoon tea. Uh, law often starts with a dispute. People have an argument. And then through the journey, there's a whole bunch of ways. And we teach the ways. It's called ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution. This is the end of the processes of court. When a lawyer takes somebody to court to represent them, actually it means they have failed. Because... Court is a very painful experience. The analogy is very deep and meaningful. Those of you that have children, teach them to clean their teeth because then they don't have to go to the dentist. 
Don't clean your teeth. You go to the dentist. Dentist gets a drill out, and it hurts. Very easy. Prevention is better than cure. Good lawyers help you prevent things. I do a lot of work for directors in business, and these are surveys, and you'll see cybersecurity, corporate social responsibility, culture, diversity, cybersecurity, digital disruption. The number one thing the world is worried about is digital information technology. When I started in Australia, that was my computer. Isn't it cute? It wasn't even colour. Um, I now use, actually, I've actually just given up using my airbook, but I buy Apple. Apple, up until this year, was the world's most valuable company, worth a trillion, I'll say it again slowly, a trillion US dollars. Does anybody know what is the world's largest company now? Microsoft. Microsoft has actually taken over, and guess what? UNE uses Microsoft Surface Pros. Ying and I, we love it. Do you have one, Charles? So the three of us, do you have one? No, what do you have, Caroline? I have Lenovo's. She has an old-fashioned laptop. <laughs> but she's a scientist, so it doesn't matter. She needs a Bunsen burner. <laughs> I, I'm just joking, I am just, just teasing. Uh, but you and E, by the way, seriously, we use some of the smartest technology available, including we have the largest license for Microsoft in the whole of Australia. So we really do use some pretty cool toys. Has anybody heard of the fourth industrial revolution? We are, at this point in time, on the cusp of the fourth industrial revolution. Information technology is really beginning to change the way things are done. Let me give you a real example. In Australia, we have two major supermarkets. Now, I'm not going to look, but Ying is thinking, I go to Audi, which is the third one. Audi is so tiny in the market share, she doesn't count. Sha, where do you go? You go to Audi as well? Caroline, where do you go? I don't shop. <laughs> you should just say online, yeah. All right, the two major players in Australia are called Woolworths, known as Woolies, or Coles, known as uh, Coles. They're the big dominant players. Coles, year on year, quarter on quarter, was beating Woolworths for sales. Woolworths thought, hmm, we've got to do something. We've always been the market leader. So they purchased a data analytics company. They let this company go crazy with all the data from their reward scheme. So they knew that Caroline buys water, and Shao buys pet food, and Ying buys shoes. <laughs> Not from, well, it was a cost. I buy, what do I buy? Apples. All right. Coles sends sales. But for me, they sell a sale through email or a text message for, say, a lady's product. I'm not going to use it, so I throw it in, I delete it. And for Ying, instead of that shoes, it sends an advert for water. And in other words, they just send out sales. Woolworths was able to go, oh yeah, Professor Adams buys apples. He likes Granny Smith apples. You're walking past Woolworths in Armadale. Bing! My phone says, did you know there's 10% off apples? Granny Smiths. Who is now the market leader? Woolworths. Woolworths has leapfrogged significantly. Coles. Why? Because they bought a data analytics company that has revolutionized the way we understand shoppers. It is amazing. Part of the skill is how do we harness artificial intelligence? How do we bring in automation? My friend, IP, data privacy, top area. How do you deal with employees' confidentiality? It's so easy if you're an employee to go, I want to leave this company and go to this company. I slip my USB thumb drive in, copy all the client files and buy. Nowadays, more and more, of course, we don't allow anybody to touch our systems because of that data theft. 
um, competition. I, I'm a big believer in information governance, which is a whole, whole other story. The use of governments are using clever technology to do analysis. Technology is really driving our compliance systems. Uh, yeah, yeah. How does this uh, impact the law? How, How does it impact the law? How did you use it? Yeah. I'll, I'll give you two examples. How did you use it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I understand your question. Two examples. Two very quick examples. First example. The law firm where I consult, they would receive 100 to 200 emails per lawyer per day. So they would spend half an hour at the end of the day filing this email with this client, what we call a matter number. So each, each email has to be allocated. So that's an half an hour you could be working doing filing. My law firm simply did a deal with lawyers in India, 100 lawyers, who overnight go through and file every email to the right place, freeing up that half hour to charge clients. Another example. In business, leasing a property, especially a commercial property, is really important. So you build an office block. You have 100 different leases. It used to take two weeks to actually draft a lease, get it out to a client. We now do it in 24 hours. We use a smart contract system where we go this field, this field, this field, this field, this field, put the data in, bang, goes out 24 hours. That has saved $1 million just by doing that. So we're saving client money. My clients often work in franchises. So there's hundreds of them, but one franchisor. We set up a secure site whereby all the franchisors could go and find their lease, find their IP agreement, find all secure by us very smart technology. Plus, the next stage is understanding blockchain, uh, understanding artificial learning, machine learning, AI, AI, all part and parcel. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. So I, I, this is very exciting. By the way, we're going to have... Am I going to the next level also if I'm uh, looking at it in a law? I mean, I'm yeah, yeah. to ask you whether that uh, the case studies, what you all go through. Yes. You know, the previous cases connecting with your present case. Already do it. That will become, I think, so Already done. Already done. In fact, Justice Kirby, one of Australia's most famous judges, 12 years ago predicted that that would happen. He was speaking at a library conference, and he actually said that. And basically it is. We can do. But the great thing is, just having the information is not being a lawyer. The lawyer skill bit is actually the interpretation. It is the advice, and it is the human side to make sure your client really understands. Um, isn't that a beautiful picture? By the way, I'm, I'm old England. This is New England, just in case you get confused. Okay. Now, how good is UNE? Now, I'm proud. I've only been there five months, but I'm very proud. In Australia, there are 40 universities, 40 law schools. And the top eight are known as the group of eight. These are the old universities. So Sydney, Melbourne, ANU, Queensland, uh, Adelaide, Monash. Well, that's all? All right. So I decided, wouldn't it be good to look how good we are or how bad we are? Wow. In 60 seconds, I'm going to try and convince you how good we are.
All right. At UNE, you would take this for granted. Obviously, we're fully accredited by the government. We provide all the requirements. I'm very proud under what's called excellence in research in Australia, which is our number one uh, measure, we are well ranked as a law school. Uh, there are five different levels, but world ranking is the one that obviously would accept. Hence, we have a very active PhD program, which is fantastic. Let's have a quick look at the Malaysian student, see his thoughts. Oh, wow, it's so amazing. Very, very warm welcome in Arabia. The first day I was here, I feel like I already make a friend around and I never feel stranger. They, even I'm from other country, they treat me as the same. And yeah, it's a very good people around in Armida. Like they don't, they don't judge you. They don't look you by skin. What religions are you? They just make a friend. My favorite things to do here, you got a lot of time around here that you can spend in any kind of way. For example, if you want to go camping, there's a beautiful place to just drive five minutes out of town. It's a bit spoiled in Army there, like driving, you can see the coast. One hour driving to outside the town, you can see a lot of hiking place. And five minutes, you can see all the blue hole and everything. Feel free. <laughs> and the best part is big space and just chuck the saddle on, just walk with the horse, you and your horse looking around, clear sky, big sun, nice weather, not sweating, <laughs> just riding. And you can't find that kind of thing in other places, like you're not gonna get comfortable as army there. The idea of uni around there is just the perfect uni. They have like good environment, not far away with home, and very nice and quiet. You can more focus, concentrate on your study instead of going. Well, welcome to Amida, it's a perfect place to study. Isn't that nice to hear? Perfect place to study. I don't know how much I had to pay him to say that, but I'm very glad he did. I am joking. He said obviously very free, but it, no, it shows a nice place. One of our facilities, um, this is one of our moot courts where we teach lawyers to be advocates. Um, I actually showed this picture in Bangkok at the STOU, the big uh, Thailand Open University, and this was one of our PhD students who's now a lecturer in that university. And I showed, I showed that's me! I went, oh, is it? Uh, which, is, which is lovely. So, to wrap up my talk, I just wanted to, some of you may have picked up a brochure as you walked in. One of the reasons for coming to Kuala Lumpur, coming to IEG, is to share with you a new development. One of the things I've been concerned about is what we generally call the open access. That is, we want people to have as much educational opportunities. Remember I started my talk by saying there are lots and lots of big cases that need labour skilled labor to help out. It doesn't necessarily need fully qualified lawyers, it needs people to have an understanding of the law to be able to help in practice. As such, we've created a brand new online Diploma of Paralegal Studies, which will help you in that stepping stone on a way to be a lawyer. It is one step with lots of exit points, but it's a great starting place to build confidence, build knowledge, and build things. And it actually launches in early November 2019, what we call T3, trimester three for our academic year. One of the things Sable, that is Science, Agriculture, Business Law, our faculty that Caroline is the Deputy Dean of, is that we allow students to go through different layers. So to start in the wonder of paralegal studies and then maybe do an advanced diploma, then enable to get into the law, the Bachelor of Legal Studies, and then there are switching mechanisms if you get certain grades to get into the Bachelor of Laws and then even get into our master's program or even finally into a PhD program if that was your choice. But the idea that there's a very straightforward, simple, clear methodology, but we believe in bite size, you know, appropriate size. So I'm only talking about our new diploma of paralegal studies. So what is a paralegal? Well, a paralegal is somebody who's there to assist the lawyers in doing their hard work, to enable them to gather the information, to learn the skills and knowledge within the legal system and under supervision. 
We can provide you with details about the entry requirements through the brochure, and, and we will talk to you afterwards if you're interested. It is an eight, we use the word unit, means subject, and it is, as I said, available fully online. Obviously, if you wish to come to Australia, you'll be most welcome. We have some great colleges. The very first two units, two subjects, are called LSU, Legal Studies Unit 100, which is the introduction to legal studies, but we pair it with Philosophy 101, the art of thinking. Remember my Rodin? Remember? Thinking is actually a really important skill. So in the very first period, you learn some law in the legal system, and you learn some thinking. They're paired together. Then you follow through language and the law, some procedure, and my colleague here, she has the most amazing book on evidence. Uh, some areas of business law, alternative dispute resolution, international law, and then one of the hardest subjects, what are called conflicts of laws or world legal systems. So understanding how it all fits together with various aspects. And as I said, we have a brochure which has some details. Now, I mentioned Charles has a, a second edition of her book, which I think is amazing. I've had the pleasure of reading that book. Do you have it right there? Do you want to hold it up, show it's real? Yeah, look at, ah, oh, that's not enough. This is television. This is streaming. Todd, Aaron, look at her book. 2018. No, no, well, I'm very proud. Charles is a, a great academic, and uh, her, her book with other Malaysian academics is really smart in the sense of it is predominantly about evidence law, which is a difficult area in Malaysian law, but it has an important commentary about Australian law, that matching up. And Charles, for any of the students, will be one of our key points of contact to make sure Malaysian students know that there's somebody who really understands. And she will be able to either advise directly or obviously get in touch with the exact right people. And uh, thank you for coming up to KL. I know it was uh, uh, personally a very busy time for you. So I think we'll prepare you for your studies, give you a chance to do an advanced diploma, or in fact we have a mechanism you can go straight into the Bachelor of Legal Studies. And as I said, the LLB does have some set requirements in terms of uh, your scores to get into that program. So that is there. If you do really well, that's an availability, but we have steps on the way. I'm actually going to... Looking at the time. Yeah. Show? No show? Show? Okay. Um, now, we weren't sure Shah was going to be able to make it. She's here in person, but we did shoot a little video. It's quite short, but it is lovely. So can I show it? Salam dan apa kabar? My name is... Shal Maributu and I teach at the UNE Law School in the areas of corporate law and civil procedure. The legal system in Malaysia and Australia share a similar common law origin from England. It's a great fit for me having experience in both Australia and Malaysia. I can really make a difference for students in my home country. Malaysia has given me a lot and I am now in a position to give something important back. The Diploma for Paralegal Studies is a unique program. It is a pathway for Malaysian students to obtain UNE's Bachelor's of Law. As a benchmark, the Diploma provides a great opportunity for students to establish or advance their careers. The Diploma for Paralegal Studies can be studied entirely online at UNE. UNE is at the forefront of online learning and has vast experience as an online provider of legal education. Together, we can get your career moving. I forgot that was that. Thank you, Charles. And as I said, if you have any questions, please come and have a chat to us and she will be able to answer them. So my last is one of my favourite quotes from a gentleman called Walter Mondale. He said, if you are sure you understand everything that's going on, you are hopelessly confused. 
Um, I hope you've enjoyed the time. I'm really open to any questions or any thoughts you have. Um, we have a few minutes for that before we have afternoon tea. Would anybody like to ask a question? A general question then. We will deal with more direct questions appropriately. No? Mr. IP lawyer, I was expecting something that's... Uh, maybe you feel more comfortable asking questions uh, in private with us having afternoon tea because we've had quite a lot of time. I thank you very much for listening. Oh, 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 you just run out of time. <laughs> no, no, please, 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 my friend. No, no, there was, there was a title given to this talk about global... Yes. Global uh, would you like to say something about that? Or is this... Right at the beginning, I went through the global profession, how it's structured, and obviously I focus on the common law. So the, bi the big part of the global profession is that we have now, in this point of history, more global businesses than we have ever had before. As such, my opening comments were law was traditionally taught in a jurisdictional specific way. Now, we need more and more lawyers in different countries to have an appreciation of the legal systems and the operational aspects in those different jurisdictions. That doesn't mean you necessarily have to be admitted to practice law in that other jurisdiction, but if you're going to brief another lawyer, your ability to understand the distinctions through those three systems is absolutely critical. So there, are, there are current agreements, I think, in Malaysia is partner, a party to one of those treaties, although in Australia is, where there is a certain amount of access into this jurisdiction by other lawyers. Correct. And you have the possibility of setting up law firms from other countries in this country, provided you, you know, comply with certain Sure. So I was wondering, you know, where, where yeah, sure. I was wondering, you know, you, I, I thought, and I think my friend here who sent my name in for this, thought that I would be interested in this because we were going to talk about this global, uh, the global nature of the profession. And there wasn't anything touched on that. And your final point on your paralegal studies, yes. which obviously is a pathway to becoming a lawyer. Correct. Um, I, and again, I suppose it would be a detail that you would be able to deal with later. Have you considered the admission requirements in Malaysia for a person who's coming with an Australian law degree, for instance? We, we, we have indeed. That's a conversation I'm happy to provide, like outside one-on-one. -on -one. Um, the point being is, is that this particular course will be directly relevant to Malaysians studying and work, wanting to work in Malaysia. So what we want to do is create opportunities by way of education to actually study something that is not generally available in Malaysia nor in a number of other jurisdictions. This program is not designed just for Malaysia, it will have a range of countries involved because basically there is actually ironically a shortage of lawyers and to retrain lawyers to get them to admission there will be a gap and the workforce needs to move much quicker um, but examples particularly are in the area of corporate and commercial and also in government so there are some restricting uh, particular requirements but again we can go into those details to what is required for that actually admissions we're not trying to move into the malaysian market to produce directly malaysian lawyers but we want to provide those opportunities in partnership the reason why i didn't have any questions because i think your lecture is actually very relevant to what actually happens in real life uh, i i practice in it law uh, principally uh, it litigation and there's a lot of cross-border work a lot of cross-border uh, work and that's the reason why I didn't have any questions because you probably answered all of them during your lecture. I think it was very yeah. Uh, yeah. informative yeah. for someone who actually doesn't do cross border work. Thank but you. I think the important part is I think we all understand, uh, we should all should understand in fact that uh, uh, the globalization is coming. Uh, I do a lot of work uh, in relation to disputes outside the UK as well. And uh, whatever you said made a lot of sense. Obviously, you have only one hour to speak. And I think the Very, very relevant, yeah. very, very informative, and thank you very much. Oh, I thank you. I wanted to say oh, that, uh, and oh, I'm glad that I came up for I very yeah, much yeah. appreciate it. Thank you. That's very kind. Very kind. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, before you um, 
all depart and have some afternoon refreshments, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Faruqi, who is going to do our vote of thanks this afternoon. Thank you. Known to you all. Thank you very much. I'm deeply honoured to be asked to say a few words of appreciation for Professor Michael Adams um, uh, for his learned lecture. Uh, rich in substance, eloquent in delivery, and full of humor and warmth. I really liked what you said about the student, not the subject, mm, must you. remain the center of our concern. Thank you very much. Must remind myself of that. Now, you touched on a whole range of things from being a good teacher to being part of the fourth industrial, industrial revolution. And uh, I think that's the point that I took special note of. Um, I have to say this, that in most fields of learning, like medicine, accountancy, uh, media, science, global developments and perspectives are readily adopted. I'm afraid that's not so in law, uh, at least not Uh, at the undergraduate level, there is very little uh, learning about comparative uh, legal systems, uh, except possibly criminal law from India, company law in Australia, and of course your uh, treatment of indigenous people, uh, especially the Mabo decision, is very highly regarded. Though I understand that there are some uh, steps forward and some steps backward going on in Australia today. But nevertheless, uh, in general, uh, I have to say that um, legal education in our country tends to be uh, rather insular. Um, you emphasized that we must broaden our horizons, evolve a global perspective. And as you were speaking uh, about the need not to confine ourselves to narrow jurisdictions, I was painfully aware of the problems we are facing in this country about civil and Sharia jurisdictions. Uh, there was a case some time ago where a non-Muslim lady who had obtained a diploma in Sharia law wanted to practice in the Sharia courts and she was refused simply on one ground of her religion. So we are building walls. We are not actually doing cross-border things. We are building walls. And I just wanted to alert you, Prof, that uh, not only do we have civil law and Sharia law, there's a large body of native law in Sabah Sarawak. And uh, these, are, these are things we don't talk about much. There is actually a lot of conflict between native courts and Sharia courts. Yes. Uh, the law in Sabah Sarawak says that if a person is a Muslim, uh, Sharia law should apply. But many natives who are also Muslims prefer to apply native law and there are clear conflicts of jurisdiction, but they are uh, not adequately publicized. But students who are studying it uh, are quite aware. So I think we all need to wake up to this inevitability of a regional as well as a global legal profession to tackle cross-border issues of refugees, statelessness, dual citizenship, marriage between people of different nationalities, um, environmental issues, foreign trade, terrorism, money laundering, and all this obviously requires cross-border perspectives. I agree with you that even if we are not allowed to practice in a foreign country, we could provide advice, consultancy, and in Malaysia, on this area, we are perhaps um, more tolerant than other legal systems. We allow ad hoc admissions to lawyers from okay. abroad, especially from the UK. Uh, so, Prof, thank you very much for providing food for thought for how Malaysia and Australia, especially the University of New England, uh, Amidale, can help our common law heritage to evolve towards a more global outlook. I've been to UNE and I'm very impressed by uh, what you are doing there. Um, I think such a global education can be delivered through collaborative, interactive learning experiences. I'd use the word distance learning and I was corrected. Uh, it's not distance learning, it's interactive, interactive learning. Yes, indeed. Um, I know that Prof. Michael Adams uh, University excels in this endeavor 
and can provide much needed help to Malaysian public universities, which are rather conservative and very, very insular. We do take in some foreign students, uh, but it's more for show. Uh, I'm talking about public universities, yes, public sir, universities. Sir. Private universities are much more uh, uh, entrepreneuring in this area. Sure, sure. Um, uh, I think what is needed is uh, uh, change of attitudes of our legal educators in public universities, change of attitudes uh, uh, in members of the bar, many of whom are here, the distinguished members, and um, sadly, qualifying boards, um, and I have to remind you, um, the most important um, sector in legal education is not the university, not the qualifying boards, but the civil servants in the ministry. <laughs> yeah. We are a highly bureaucratized state. The bureaucrats really rule the country. Mm -hmm. uh, there are not 20 vice chancellors in 20 public universities. There's only one vice chancellor, and that is the chief secretary <laughs> of the Ministry of Education. <laughs> He's the only Vice Chancellor. <laughs> so th that's the way it works, Prof. But nevertheless, uh, I, I know that your university has been trying for some time. Uh, partial reception was given. But uh, once you have a good scheme, once you have a good aim, ultimately it, it will succeed. But um, the universities don't really have the power or the money to make these decisions. You have to tackle the ministry uh, because we are a bureaucratic state. So thank you very much for this useful suggestions and I hope and pray that your initiatives may come to fruition um, and whatever uh, we can do um, the academicians will be very happy to join with you. Thank you very much. Thank you.